2023, y'all. Welcome to the show. First live stream of 2023. I am a little bit early, so essentially what I'm going to do is I'm just going to hang out here for a few minutes um, and let the stream go for a bit um, until we get a few more people in. Um, So I'm just finishing setting a few things up uh, on the computer here. Um, yeah, so yeah, three or four minutes here. I'm just gonna be kind of probably just rambling on a little bit here while I'm um, going over some things on the computer. I am working on changing um, to where this is going to be an actual show. Um, I do have a co host that's going to be joining me. I do plan on having a few special guests join in as well to co host the show. Um, And essentially what the show is going to end up being is something more along the lines of um, kind of a chat show, um, uh, more podcasty style, um, but podcast where we'll have live interaction because obviously we'll be uh, live streaming. Um, But we really are planning on... um, making it a an unfiltered format where we're going to be able to talk about anything we want. We're going to be able to bash whoever the hell we want. Um, hey, Kurt. Um, primarily because we're not uh, we're not going to be doing any kind of sponsors or anything like that. Happy New Year to you as well. Hope you had a great holiday. Um, but yeah, we don't want to be beholden to anybody. We don't want to have sponsors or anything like that. Um, primarily because we want to be able to call people and companies within the RC community out on their BS. Um, you know, and there's there's plenty of BS in the RC community to go around. Plenty of it. Um, I think everybody, I, I think everybody's had an experience or experiences in RC um, that don't necessarily reflect all that great on the RC hobby as a whole. Um, I mean, me personally, I'm and I'm a huge advocate. I believe as a whole, the RC community, um, and I'm talking the RC community, boats, planes, uh, trucks, bashers, you name it. Um, as a whole, I think it's a, a fairly inviting community, a fairly open. Um, people are generally friendly. Um, but as there, as with anything where people come together, there, there's going to be clicks, there's going to be, you know, community, and then there's going to be little sub communities within the overall community. Um, you know, it's something I want to talk about today because, um, there, the, the sad part about, um, the sub communities and sort of clickiness, of pretty much anywhere you go. I mean, anywhere you go in anything, not just RC, um, you're going to run into people will migrate to like-minded people. So, you know, within the RC crawler community, you're going to have, um, and community, four-wheel drive community at large, you're going to have the Toyota people are going to grad, they're going to gradually move towards Toyota people. Jeep people are going to move gradually towards Jeep people. Um, and they're going to create their own little sub clicks. Um, and it's sort of a, uh, it, it's, you know, it, it it's going to happen no matter what. It is just simply human nature. Um, but within those sub RC communities are, are, are the people that just bring the BS with them. Um, and I'm, you know, people that, you know, scam artists, the, you know, the, the a-holes, the, um, the know-it-alls, they, they, you know, they're just people that, that's what happens. It, it's just what happens. Again, it's, it's human nature. And we're never going to be able to change that about human nature. Um, but... There, I think there are certain things that we can do um, as an as the RC community um, that we can start 
um, being more critical of, you know, certain things that happen, um, the, the way certain things are done, not just by uh, big corporations, but small companies, uh, groups within the, the community, organizations that are within the community, um, that I, I think we're at the point now where with everything else that's going on in the world, with all of the division, with all of the BS, with everything else that's going on, it is we in a consumer based world, um, which is essentially where we are. You know, a little communism sp sp sprinkled around here and there, uh, but it, it essentially the, the world has sort of moved towards a capitalism, consumerism um, type of market. And the way that it's supposed to work is that competition is supposed to drive things that competition between companies is supposed to make those companies provide better products. But what's happened over many, many decades now is that we have the illusion of a bunch of companies that are competing with one another, but they're really not because they're under the umbrella of the same company. Um, you know, Horizon Hobbies is a perfect example. Horizon Hobbies doesn't actually manufacture um, or wasn't a manufacturer. Horizon Hobbies is essentially just a their distributor. Um, but they their parent company started buying up all of these other RC companies with the understanding that their main distribution network, Horizon Hobby, would be able to maximize profits if they owned all of these little companies actual low c you know which business wise it's a it's a smart move but it's under you know if we go back and look at at the regular automotive industry and for instance um gm the gm corporation owned oh, gm uh was a GMC, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile. Uh, I can't remember. It, but they owned like a whole bunch of companies. And they were essentially competing against one another, which was stupid. And in 2008, when the United States government, in their infinite wisdom, decided to give a bunch of money to automotive companies, one of the things they dictated before they were given that money was that you guys got to get rid of some of these companies because you're literally shooting yourselves in the foot. Now, Horizon has taken um, where they own a bunch of different companies, but those companies, they're separating them so that they're not competing with one another. So Losi isn't really making crawlers at all anymore. They're, they're still making race cars and they're making... I don't know if you call them the bashers. They're mega bashers, um, but they're they're on a they're on a different end of the basher spectrum than say Arma. Now Arma is. Good morning, Robert. Hope you had a wonderful holiday, my friend. Happy New Year. Um, Arma's on a different spectrum basher than. JB, my friend, how are you? Um, Arma's on a different spectrum than Losi's bashers. Um, Losi seems is a little bit more on the performance end of bashing, where Arma is more on the ridiculous end of bashing. So they sort of compete against one another, but they sort of don't. But grand scheme of things is Horizon is trying to separate so that their individual little brands aren't necessarily competing directly with one another. Because, again, that's shooting yourself in the foot. On the other end of the spectrum or on the other end of the, the things would be a company like Traxxas, who is essentially just a sole company that they make RC cars. That's what they do. They don't have any other brands. They don't have anything. They just make their stuff and they sell it. I'm personally not a big fan of 
tracks us because of some of their big business practices. But as far as the product that they provide, they are definitely top notch. Kind of a bold statement saying the fastest name in RC, but eh, okay, I'll give you that. Um, Black Wolf, good to see you. Happy New Year. Um, and so I, I digress. Um, so where I'm, I'm going to circle back down to the the RC community, which is. Um, you have all these sub communities within the communities, you know, like social media, you have, you know, a hundred Traxxas fan pages uh, and fan groups and a hundred Arma fan pages and fan groups. And it is. <laughs> uh I, ha I give Traxxas a lot of credit for the product that they bring to the market. Their product is top-notch, absolutely top-notch. I, I still stand by my statement that the X-Max is hands down the king of bashers. Nobody has been able to come even remotely close to making something that equals the X-Max in both its ridiculousness and its toughness. Um, and that is no personal experience, but talking to many, many people who have Traxxas and Armas and all kinds of different vehicles that have said, hands down, the X-Max is the best. And it, you know, you got to hand it to Traxxas. But um, within those sub-communities, I... I I found it hilarious that <laughs> my cat wants to go back inside and she just, she will sit at the door and she will do this for hours unless I get up. So hold that thought for one second. We're going to let the cat go inside. Should have done that before I started the live, but <laughs> yeah, this is what happens. <laughs> hey, JM, how are you? Happy New Year. Um, I have found it hilarious. And, you know, I, I find it funny to go through and read. And at one point, I actually thought about, like, taking screenshots and posting screenshots of some of the most hilarious arguments between the Arma and Traxxas people, because there is no uh, there is no rivalry in RC that is as strong or ever has been as strong as the as the Traxxas Arma, um, you know. And I go back to uh, the days of Associated and and Losi racing days, and the the huge rivalry that was there. Uh, now, obviously, there wasn't a lot of social media. There wasn't any social media back then in the beginning. Um, but <laughs> the rivalry between the Arma and Traxxas fans is unparalleled anywhere else, with the exception of maybe, maybe, uh, Lewis Hamilton fans and Max Verstappen fans in Formula One. If you're familiar with Formula One, you'll know what I'm talking about. If not... Um, trust me, it's very heated <laughs> and they hate each other with a passion. Um, but part of what it is, uh, part about where I'm getting going with this is part of it is the, the division within the communities, the division within the communities, especially the RC community is, um, it's sort of a silly thing. It's just a small part, and the, the rival thing really is a small part of it. Um, but there is still there is still the the clickiness that happens no matter where you go. Um, and that I think that's something that we as the consumers, we as the um, we need to push to get the 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 clickiness um, out of it. Um, 
you know, like I said, we're we're the consumers in in a in a true capitalist uh, movement in a society. We the consumers hold so much power um, in dictating what should happen, uh, and that's why essentially you see a lot of products that get better and go through development process and get better over time because we the consumer demand it. If we go out and spend five hundred dollars on an RTR and it's a piece of crap. We're going to tell everybody that's a piece of crap and they're not going to sell very many of them. So they're going to have to improve it and make it better so that they can continue to sell it. Or they just simply are going to discontinue it and not sell it at all anymore. Um, the other part of the RC community to me is um, the BS part of it. Um we need to do a better job as a community of <laughs> not the brown shoe part of it, the bullshit part of it, Mr. JB. <laughs> um, what I mean by the, the, the bullshit is the bullshitters, um, the people who, um, yeah. It's hard to say it without pointing fingers at specific groups or organizations, um, of which I've said I will not name specific organizations or groups of people because, A, I don't want to get myself in trouble, and, B, um, I don't, I don't want to bad, I don't want to badmouth anybody directly. Um, but essentially, groups of people that say they do stuff and claim they do stuff, but they essentially they are standing up on a hill yelling and screaming and telling people, we're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this. Um, and they get a whole bunch of people down at the bottom hill that are cheering and, uh, you know, great job, everything. And, but they're, they're really not they're not really doing anything. They're, they're just telling you that they're doing stuff, but they're, they're not actually showing anybody what they're doing. Um, yes, no lawsuits. <laughs> um, cause it's, you know, and it, if you should always be able to ask questions, I was, you know, I am a, 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 a Gen Xer. <coughs> um, I was brought up in society. We were told to question everything that question authority, question everything, you know, the parental advisory lyrics, all of that. Um, and it seems like we have gotten to a point now where we're not allowed to ask questions, even in things as simple as the RC community. We're not able to question things. Whoa. You can't question. You can't ask a question. You can't say, you can't say this. Whoa, 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 because you're not allowed to. Uh, <laughs> um, but it's, we should, we should be asking questions. We should be asking questions of everybody involved in the RC community. Uh, anytime that you go to an event and there's somebody uh, hosting some charity thing at that event, and they're taking in donations and and whatnot. You know, you you should be able to walk up to that charity and say, "Okay, what do you guys do?" Uh, you know, and they should be explained to it. Okay, well, how much, you know, how much money do you guys take in? How much money do you guys uh, give out? You know, what you know, what's the you know what's the actual value? I mean, are you guys a charity that collects a hundred dollars a year? Are you guys a charity that collects eighty million dollars a year? Um, and again, I won't say specifically, but there is a charity that in 2021 took in $80 million on record, $80 million and showed absolutely no proof that what they were saying they were doing was what they were actually doing. And then it turned out later on that we, you hear stories about the people who were the, the upper management of this group were out spending millions of dollars. And all of these people came from, you know, humble settings. 
these were not uh, this was not a charity that was created by multimillionaires. This was a charity that was created by people who lived normal, middle and lower class lives and suddenly through this charity became multimillionaires. <laughs> um, and, you know, as far as I'm concerned, and it, as far as what I believe is that anybody who's who calls themselves a charity, um, you should be required by us, the consumer, you should be required to be out there showing all your receipts. You should be showing us everything. Total and complete transparency, because. If you were, if you are doing what you say you're doing, um, you have to you you have to provide the backup for it. And this is you know every major charitable organization out there. If you go onto their website, at some point on their website, you can find their financial disclosures. Um, partly because they you know. Uh, you know, they want that transparency. They want people to know, hey, you know what? This year we took in $80 million and we spent $75 million of that doing this to help people. You know, we spent $5 million paying all of us, taking care of all the organizational type things. And the rest of it all went to doing what it's supposed to be doing. Whereas a company that isn't transparent, um, isn't going to want to show you that they're, they don't want to tell you that this is in essence a, that this is a money grab. We're doing this so that we can enhance here, not out there. Um, thank you, Robert. And I know for me, this is a touchy subject. Um, I've been involved in charity and nonprofits, um, I've been involved in um, politics. Where, hey, Coach D, good afternoon, happy 2023, happy New Year's to you. Um, I've been involved in politics where, basically, a nonprofit organization. There are so many ways that you can skirt around what a nonprofit organization is. Um, and there is no more prime example of skirting around that, which would be in politics and political action committees and super PACs and, and these guys that run unregulated campaigns and they're allowed to take in money from anywhere, from anybody, it doesn't matter. And because they're not officially associated with the official campaign of somebody, I'll use a, you know, presidential politician candidate. Um, they're not officially connected to that person's campaign, but they are allowed to contribute money to that person's campaign. They're actually allowed to contribute money to any campaign directly that they want, as long as it falls within the federal limits. Um but doesn't have to, they don't have to disclose where any of this money comes from. And this is when you hear people talking about dark money and whatnot. But I'm just using it as an example of you can take a whole bunch of money as a nonprofit organization. You could take in a whole bunch of money and not necessarily spend very much of that money on what you actually are set up to do. You can spend a majority of that money on just simply taking care of the organization and organizational costs because the government and the IRS will allow you to. Um, and I'm going to... Most charitable and nonprofit organizations fail because of negligence. Not necessarily because what they were doing was nefarious, but they fail because of negligence and negligence to me falls in the category of not being transparent. Um, you know, <laughs> exactly. BS you can, it, it as the, 
if you are if you are the 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 president of a of a charity and your you know your charity takes in 80 million dollars a year and you pay yourself a 10 million dollar a year salary it's allowed but <laughs> that's not really the point it's not really why people donate money to charities. And, and I'm getting to the point now where I'm kind of getting tired of everywhere I go, everybody is collecting money all the time. No matter where you go, somebody's always asking you, oh, do you want to donate to this? Do you want to donate to that? Do you want to die? It's like, my God, I can't go anywhere without basically being guilted into, you know, hey, donate for, for these, you know, poor sick kids over here or for these homeless people over here. And for me personally, when I am seeing this, um, knowing what I know about politics and the, and the inner workings of the government, um, the way that most of these charitable organizations are run and all of the, all of the things that happen on the inside of them and the behind the scenes stuff, really doesn't it really isn't as much as you think it doesn't you know filing to be a a 501 nonprofit organization um doesn't legitimize your organization at all it just means that the irs recognizes that you're going to operate under these rules we will allow you to call yourself this we will allow you to take donations from a b and c because you're going to operate under these rules but it doesn't legitimize your organization by just having that oh we're this that means we're legit now it just means that you filled out a bunch of paperwork a, which is essentially a really, really intense version of filling out your taxes. Um, the consequences, on the other hand, for for doing things wrong with a charitable organization or nonprofit uh, can be quite severe. Um, for those of you who have never heard about how the Wounded Warrior Program began, uh, Wounded Warrior Program began um, under some sort of good idea, bad practices. Um, I said I wasn't going to mention it by name, but <laughs> I did, um, only because this is a widely known story of what happened with w Wounded Warrior in the beginning and how the under new management, they completely turned Wounded Warrior around and made it the program that we recognize today. Uh, but it always wasn't that it wasn't as uh, great a program as it is then <sighs> opening up nonprofits so they could broaden marijuana through California absolutely when it comes to nonprofit organizations and politics um, personally I believe that there should be no such thing as a pack or a super pack there should be a cap on political campaigns period you should only be allowed to spend so much money. There should be complete transparency that anybody that donates any money to a campaign, it has to go directly to that campaign. And every single person that donates, even if it's a one penny donation, that person's name has to be in a ledger somewhere. NorCal, brother, happy new year. Um, you know, just to, to clean up, clean up the, 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 the nonsense that's in Washington, D.C. And I'm going to get on my soapbox right now because uh, I know there's there's four of us here. Uh, but anybody, oh, now there's five politicians that go to work in Washington as senator, house representative, president, vice president, Supreme Court justice. They should only be able to collect their salary and that's it. They should not be able to invest money. They should not be able to have access. They should not be able to at all, period. Prime example, it's a politician named Liz Cheney, who was a representative from Wyoming, went into Congress six years ago with a net worth of $7 million, left 
well, will be leaving in two days as her last day in Congress with a net worth of $44 million. That is, she grew her net worth seven times over six years by basically being a politician in Washington, D.C., which is kind of BS. And you can go through the whole list, both sides, Republicans and Democrats, you can go through and find any number of them that have increased their wealth a multitude of times, many times over while they've been in office. That That is screwing us, us, we the people. We're getting screwed there. So that soapbox, I'm going to get off that soapbox because I don't want to get into talking about crazy politics. But... um yeah, we should be holding everyone more accountable. Um, exactly, Norcal. They passed a law that said that they're immune from insider trading. And the person who's most guilty of that was the Speaker of the House, the third most powerful person in our government. It's basically third in line for the presidency. Forced the law that they can't be prosecuted for insider trading, even though we all know that they're guilty of insider trading. And if I did it, I'd go to prison like Martha Stewart. But if the Speaker of the House does it or her husband does it, uh, they just make 30 or $40 million a year in investments. Absolutely. Insane. Anyhow, we're here talking about RC. Don't get me started on politics because that would be a whole nother channel with a whole different live stream. And I thought about it, but more conservative people on YouTube um, who'd have live shows and whatnot, uh, most of the time they get crucified um, and they have to deal with so much BS. <laughs> Yes, I can tell everybody that um, I, I I am in fairly good health, and I have no intention of committing suicide at any <laughs> at any point. <laughs> um, the uh, off of that soapbox and back to the the RC community and charitable organizations and the transparency that should happen there. Um, and not, not just RC organizations, charitable organizations, but all charitable organizations, for that matter, should have 100% trans transparency in what they're doing, how much money they're taking in, where their money's going, um, how exactly their organization is helping whatever they say their organization is supposed to be helping. That is that is key. Um, and there, you know, there is no shortage of people in organizations in the RC community that have basically screwed people out of money, said that they were doing something, gathered a bunch of money and then never, never did it. I know from my own personal experience, um, seeing, People and groups that would take in money under the auspice that they were going to do something for a group and then never did anything for that group. And there really isn't anything that the group can do or say um, to that person because it becomes it becomes a legal issue. And that's, you know, that's the crappy part about things. Um, but, yeah, that is. That is um, something that I've, I've wanted to talk about, and I've touched on a little bit in, in other live streams, but I really wanted to get into the, to the nitty-gritty about charitable nonprofit organizations being held accountable for what they say. Because if you say you're going to do something and you get people to donate anything and everything to you, and then you need you need to show everybody. You need to show the receipts. You need to show the you need to show the proof. But anyhow, my next topic, and this one, this one is excellent because 
I laughed really hard about this when I saw it on the Scale News update yesterday, which was um, FMS essentially pulling everything Jeep related off of their website and the Mashigan disappearing. Um, because I had praised the Mashigan for how great it looked and how scale it looked. And evidently it was a little bit too good um, because Jeep stepped in and basically said, you, you didn't, you didn't have permission to do that. Um, and I would say that it probably wasn't even Jeep. Uh, I would say this is probably more along the lines of um, industrial shenanigans going on where a company who has paid licensing um, and who has gone the lengths of getting, you know, licensing so that they can produce, you know, a Chevy, a Jeep, a Toyota or whatever, probably notified Jeep saying, hey, these guys are over here making this thing that they've obviously made a Jeep. They're not selling it as a Jeep. They're not calling it a Jeep, but it looks exactly like a Jeep. And the Jeep people sent a letter off and then poof, some FMS doesn't have uh, the mash again on their website anymore. And I thought that was kind of funny. Um, I also thought it was interesting that Harley raised the issue of how there's two sides of the fence where people say, uh, that's just a big company who's, you know, bullying this poor little RC company. Um, <laughs> um, I, no, uh, uh, JB, you cannot. You cannot just take in a bunch of money and then give it to your friends. That uh, That is technically not allowed. Well... Technically, it is actually allowed, but it's, for the most part of society, it's considered kind of unethical and immoral. But it's, that's just my personal definition of it. Um, but the whole licensing thing, um, I had, I know that it's been talked about a couple of times, um, Harley specifically has talked about it, that um, would you be more interested in having something that resembles something and pay less for it than have a licensed version of something and pay more? Because there is that, that licensing fee. And I've always said, I would rather, you know, me personally, um, I'm, I'm right down the middle with that. If I want to go out and buy a Jeep body for one of my rigs, I will pay extra because it's a Jeep, because it's got the Jeep logo on there. Maybe I'm going for the scale look, and I want it to be a Jeep. I have the Toyota LC70 from Killer Body. You know, it's relatively expensive because it's a licensed body, um, also because it's really scale. But it is there is a factor of price in there included because the Toyota logo is slapped everywhere. The Toyota logo is on the body. It's made to look exactly like a real... You know, um, <laughs> um, but there's that, you know, there's that licensing and I would pay for that because I want it to be a Toyota. Um, uh, but like, for instance, element has said that they're not doing like licensed bodies because it keeps the cost down. Um, even though they managed to get away with the trail runner looking exactly like a Toyota forerunner. Okay. Not exactly. They did mix it up enough so that it doesn't look exactly, but I think most people went, were able to go to night customs and do all of that to where they were basically made, they were able to make it into an exact replica of a Toyota 4Runner without having that additional cost. It's good for Element, it's good for night customs, maybe not good for Toyota, but who cares? Toyota's the number one car company in the world. But when it comes to licensing, and I'm on the I'm on the firm belief that licensing is important. Intellectual property rights are important. And if you if you want something that looks similar to, and you design something that looks similar to, and you're selling something that looks similar to, it has to be different enough. 
to justify that you didn't just copy something that somebody else did, slap your logo on it, and then sell it. Um, I worked for several different manufacturing companies as a design engineer, and I can tell you that depending on the, the scale of what you were... <laughs> Um, you, depending on the scale of what you're making. So now let's say I am Rich's car company and I go and buy a Tesla Model S and I deconstruct the Tesla Model S. And the law says in the United States that all I have to do is change it by 30% and then I can't be sued for copyright or patent infringement. Now, there's gray areas there because if I were to just simply take the battery, the motor, the drive tank technology and copy that and then change the body by 30%, that wouldn't work. Tesla could sue me because I copied what they did. So that's across the board. When it comes to, um, you know, something like an RC body, that's pretty cut and dry. It has to be different enough that you there. It is distinguishable that you didn't just copy this thing, scale it down and make an exact replica of it. Um, because there are a lot of costs and there's a lot of projections that happen when the Jeep company designed the Jeep and every year they're designing new aspects of the Jeep. They have a team of engineers that team of engineers, there might be 20 or 30 of them that work in the development department. Um, and that team of engineers could be making anywhere from 60 to $200,000 a year. Now, if they spend six months developing the 2023 Jeep Wrangler, you have all of that expense that is piled up in developing what is essentially just a few odds and ends that are different from the 22 2022 Jeep Wrangler. And, but that cost is all incurred by Jeep as part of their operating costs. But what they do is when we come out with the 2023 Jeep, we have a projection of we're going to sell X amount of units. And that is going to make us all of this money back plus our projected profit. Now, if Rich's car company goes and copies the 2023 Jeep Wrangler, slaps some different logos on the side of it and sells it for three quarters of the cost because a, I didn't, in, I didn't incur any of those development costs. I just took somebody else's thing, slapped a logo on it and produced it. Um, obviously I can manufacture it with no development, no engineering time. I can manufacture it for a lot cheaper and I can sell it for a lot cheaper because I don't have to worry about paying a bunch of engineers millions of dollars a year. This is something that's been going on with China for a long time. China basically is so protected itself from copyright, uh, patent, and intellectual property lawsuits, primarily because the government owns everything and the government won't allow anybody to step in and essentially sue them. Um, so they have they have been able to rob and steal all kinds of things, manufacture them and sell them for dirt cheap. Essentially companies like Amazon and Walmart have been making a fortune selling these products to us, the consumers at large, primarily because why would I go spend a hundred dollars on something when I can buy it on Amazon for 30? And it's essentially the same thing. Not, not everything is the same. I know it's not all the same. Not everything works that way. Sometimes you buy crap from China and it's just that it's crap. But there's a lot of things that you can buy that are essentially the identically the same thing as what you can buy from a German, American, British manufacturer. Um, but it's a quarter of the cost. Uh, case in point, uh, voodoo. I know there was a big thing that happened a couple of years ago with Voodoo, where Voodoo had gone to a Chinese manufacturer to make RC car tires, 
something happened there. Nobody quite knows except for the manufacturer and the guys at Voodoo what exactly happened there. But what happened was the Chinese manufacturer started making and selling Voodoo tires, which were exactly the same. They even had the Voodoo logo on the side of them for a third the cost. And it it obviously cost a lot of money uh, for for the for the voodoo guys hey and there is essentially nothing that anybody could do um and there are companies like nike uh, adidas um a couple other i can't think of uh that ran into the same issue um at the iphone chris if you go to china right now you can go to shanghai and you can walk down the the the, the street and see an iphone store that has absolutely nothing to do with the Apple Corporation. They literally make, manufacture, and sell iPhones in China that do not, are not a part of the Apple Corporation at all. And Apple can't do anything about it. Sucks to be you, Apple. Sucks to be you, whomever. Um, yes, China, China has gotten away with so much, and it's... Now, again, transparency and accountability. This is where, you know, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt for us um, to stop helping the Chinese market to do that because we're the ones that are going to have to suffer and pay more money for products. And, you know, the only, this is, you know, hitting them in the checkbook is the only way to stop these kind of things from happening. And unfortunately, this, this deck is stacked so against us. Um, it's, it's incredibly difficult. I know I, me personally, um, I'm going to go on Amazon. I'm going to buy a bunch of stuff on Amazon long before I'm going to go to Amain, Horizon, Tower Hobbies, any of those guys and buy anything from them. And even after that is when I'm going to think about going to an actual hobby store and buying something from an actual hobby store. Because the hobby store is going to be even more expensive than the A-Mains and the Horizon and the Tower Hobbies are online. And then Amazon is going to be even cheaper than them. So, you know, if it's going to cost me personally $100 more to buy something, I don't have money to throw around. I'm just... I'm not made of money. I don't have a money tree. Um, you know, I, I live a, a fairly modest lifestyle. Uh, and anytime I can save money, I'm going to save money. Shade Tree, welcome, man. Happy New Year. Um, so, but I know in the long run, it's, you know, China's hurting everybody. And that's the fact of the matter is the, the way China does business, the way, the way they've been doing business, it's hurting everybody except for China. China's looking out for number one. And I mean, when it comes to capitalism, China's kicking everybody's ass, plain and simple, They're kicking everybody's ass. They, they figured out that manufacturing is where it's at. Manufacturing and having manufacturing and cheap labor is where it's at. That is how you are going to maximize your country's income and GDP. It was something that during the Industrial Revolution, the United States absolutely wrote the book on how to make your country super, super successful and how to explode your economy. And that was to have a bunch of manufacturing going on. Ooh, a bully to build. Very nice. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, I, I'm actually, I'm a prime example of somebody who lost his job um, because of China, Chinese manufacturing. I worked for a company that was in California. We manufactured equipment in California. We were at one point the global leader in manufacturing this type of equipment. And essentially over the course of eight years, um, the parent company of us opened, purchased and opened a manufacturing facility in China and essentially 
there were three locations in the world where our company manufactured products, uh, California, uh, Germany, and Ohio. Uh, first to close down was the Ohio plant. Second to close down was the Oxnard plant, uh, which California, which was where I worked. And the last, which is still technically running, but it is only, uh, there is no manufacturing being done there. It is basically management and engineering design um, was Germany. Um, so essentially about 500 people lost their jobs and the parent company had invested billions of dollars in making a state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in China, which is now the main manufacturing facility for this company. Um, and the quality of the product is not as good. They have lost their number one ranking in the world, which has now been taking, taken over. Long story short, uh, the company that is now number one was the company that originally started all of it. They sold to this big umbrella company that I worked for, who then filtered and ran the business into the ground. And the guys who started the original industry, basically, have now restarted a new company and taken over the number one spot where they also have a manufacturing facility in California, but also have a manufacturing facility in China, partly because of this type of equipment that is sold and used in China can only now be manufactured in China. It's, it's, it's crazy. Yes, influencer economy, and the influencers are, for the most part, jackasses. I agree, Nor NorCal. We are mainly an influencer. The, the biggest thing, the biggest net product that the United States now produces and manufactures is lawyers, um, and, uh, and basically designer slash, you know, techie type developers. Um, it's sad. It is sad. We used to be a, a country that um, people from other countries would send their kids here to be educated in things like electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, uh, medical field, um, and things like that. And now we basically have a bunch of people that I don't know why uh, YouTube is he keeps flagging stuff. It's because you use the it's because you use the little asterisk thing. Um, yes, shade tree. That is exactly it. Um, I know for a fact that um, manufacturing plant in China that manufactures a very well known certain electronic product um, actually. Their product is manufactured in what is essentially a city. And that city is owned and run by this manufacturer. And they provide everything. So we're talking cradle to grave. There are generations of people that will work for this company and live in this city and not go anywhere else. Maybe they'll take one or two vacations somewhere but for the most part, they will live and die in the same city in China. Their food, their rent, their education, training, everything is provided for them so that they never have to go or do anything. And essentially, they get paid about $80 to $100 a month. We can't compete with that here. Average medium home price in the United States as of January 3rd, 2023 is Four hundred and seventy-one thousand dollars. And swallow that one. Average price. Average. It's it's ludicrous. Um, but you know we're you know the RC community is just this little tiny microcosm in this in, in this you know global economy 
And, you know, they've made it. How hard is it to go to justify spending the money to buy a brand new brand name lipo battery right now? You know, I'm talking a Spectrum, a Gen Zays, uh, whomever. How hard is it to justify spending the money on one of those rather than I can go on Amazon and buy a 3S 4500 milliamp freaking lipo battery for like $35. Or I can buy the same thing from Gen Zays for 90 I can buy three of these. Yeah. 350 bucks for max amps. Yeah, I mean, I can buy three of these Amazons where I can take two of them, storage charge them, put it in a lipo bag, and just let it sit over there doing nothing while I use one of them until I ruin it. And then I take one of them out of the lipo bag, I discharge the one, throw it in the garbage, take the other one. How long could I go before I would have to go buy three more batteries? I bet you I could go for probably years of using those three batteries. Exactly, NorCal. I had a prime example. I had a brand name LiPo. Uh, a, 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 a squatty pack. Uh, that One of the few packs that fit properly in my Capra. Brand name. Not going to say the name because I don't want to get sued. Brand name. Had that battery for a year. One year, that battery. And then all of a sudden... My charger wouldn't accept it anymore. It just voltage is off, voltage is blah, blah, blah. And I tried everything I could to try and get that pack back, and it just absolutely would not take a charge. It was gone. And eventually, after farting around with it a bit, it eventually pup, puffed up to the point where I just discharged the thing and threw it in the freaking trash because it was junk. And I originally spent $79 on that pack. The replacement pack that I got, I actually spent $75 and I got four of the same pack, slightly bigger, doesn't fit in the camper quite as nice, but I got four of them for $62. Got four batteries for less than I got one battery. And all four of those batteries I still have two years later. Not a single problem with any of them. Don't get me wrong, I've had problems with some crappy packs, but I'm willing to accept lesser product because I didn't spend as much money. It makes me more mad if I spend 350 bucks on a Max Ant pack that takes a crap after six months than if I spend $23 on a pack that takes a crap after six months. That is, and that is... I talked about it in a video I made about shocks. Um, if you haven't watched that video, I talk all about shocks. I talk about whether, you know, there's three parts to that series. This, I believe it's the second video where I'm talking about expensive shocks versus cheap shocks and whether it's worth the investment. And nine times out of 10, I would say absolutely not worth the investment. Um, I bought a pair of a set of blue and silver King Racing esque shocks. Didn't have a little pity bag on there. Didn't have the King Racing logo on there. It's just blue and white. Looked just like a set of King Racing shocks in scaled down version. I've had those on my uh, G Made. For the entire time that I've had my G made Komodo, and I have rebuilt those shocks one time. One time I've refilled the oils. That's two years, two years driving that truck around. I had a brand name King Racing shop, little reservoir, little King logo on there that I drove one time and ruined them. <laughs> yeah. And I'll tell you what, NorCal, I have found uh, I have found another. Um, it is an aluminum Amazon. Uh, I think it was like 46 bucks, like B-E-T-U or B-E-K-U. But it's a 45 kg um, aluminum waterproof servo, steel gears, the whole thing. 
Um, I have been running that in uh, one of my, oh, it's in my Phoenix, actually. Um, yeah, I, absolute beast of a servo. I know it's not 45 kg. I, I know it's not. It's not that. It's not that strong. It's pretty strong, not that strong. Uh, I know like the, the super cheap 25, 35 kg ones, um, I, for what? For crawling, they they're they're great. I have a twenty five kg Amazon that's in my Typhon. Been in my Typhon since I burned up the first one the second time I had it out. So two years again, two years that servo's not a single problem with it. I would much rather, you know. And there at the same time, yeah, you know, I'm sort of shooting my argument down by saying we have to stop buying stuff from China, but at the same time, we have to figure out a way to, I don't necessarily want us to just charge China a bunch of money to import their stuff so that their crappy 25 kg servo costs the same amount as a reefs servo. What I really would like to find is that middle ground where we can get the costs of making stuff in America down while bringing the Chinese stuff up enough to where it's still competitive. $99 for a rebuild kit. Yeah. I mean, that's, you can literally go buy like four, four Amazon servos for that much and just freaking throw them away. You wear one out, throw it away, buy it, throw a new one in there. Going to cost you a little bit of time when you're out bashing and having fun, but <laughs> And that, you know, this, the, the, the shocks, the king shocks. I was shocked when I reached out to this company and said, hey, I literally took this thing out one time and every single one of your shocks leaked after about four hours of runtime. Basher boy, happy New Year's. Um, after about four hours of runtime out on a trail, every single one of your shocks leaked. Two of them leaked so bad that it was actually sucking the dirt up inside of the shock and created an oil mud sludge inside of the shock body, which ruined the inside of the shock body. And I was actually shocked that this company refused to, to replace the shocks. They sent me rebuild kits, which consists of seals and shafts. And th those shocks are still, they're sitting, they're sitting in a box I can't reach. They're sitting in that box. Actually, they're sitting in a box down below that. Uh, they're still, they're sitting in a box. I'm not even using them because they were completely ruined. The inside was so uh, scored and marred from pieces of rock and dirt going in there that it ruined them. And those things cost me 60 bucks for two. I spent $120 on shocks. They're literally sitting in a box over there. Useless. <laughs> And I was shocked. And it's why I've never bought anything from that company ever again. They, I actually bought those through A-Main Hobbies. And, you know, unfortunately for A-Main, there was nothing they could do. Because it's just, you know, they told me that I could return them. And that they would give me my money back. But the only way they could accept a return is if it came back in its original package unused, which obviously I couldn't do. They were destroyed. So, and I don't really fault A Main for that because it's not it's not A Main's fault. A Main didn't manufacture these pieces of crap. Somebody else did. So, <laughs> pun intended. Um, but yeah, it's. The, the world we live in right now seems to be, oh, no. We're all, we're going to, are we going to do dad jokes? Are we Are going to do some dad jokes? Because I got, I got some dad jokes that I could throw out there that some of them might, some of them might make you sick. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do it. Um, I used to be a big fan of A-Main. A-Main has some of the best customer service out of any of the, the big uh, online retailers. 
um, just in that. <laughs> now, see, Bash, what I did not mention there, the manufacturer by name. Uh, but if you want to put that in the chat, you absolutely, uh, you absolutely uh, can. Um, and yes, those are the shocks that Basher Boy is saying. Those are the shocks. They're absolutely the biggest pieces of junk. And I've actually reached out to King and told them that you guys need, you know, this is your name that they're putting on this. You guys need to call them and tell them. They need to do something to make that better because they are damaging your brand. They're literally, you know, they, you know, one of the best, one of the best shocks in the world for, for off-road racing are King shocks. Yet in the scale and RC world, they're literally some of the worst. Yes, I'm like I said, I've never bought anything from that company ever again, um, primarily because they 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 really weren't they weren't willing to stand behind their product. And to me, that's that's a big deal. You know, as as somebody who's been involved in manufacturing and uh, and selling the products and now working for a a big company. Uh, in the AC, you know, working for Reem now. Um, that's one of the things that uh, drew, drew me and convinced me to take the job with Reem uh, was the fact that they, A, it's a private company. Uh, it's not publicly owned and sold. It's not on the stock market. It is a privately hold, held company. They have a board of directors that makes decisions about things as a group. Um but they also stand behind their products. If you have a, you know, a problem with one of their units, I can guarantee you that push comes to shove, Ream will stand behind their product. If you are absolutely upset and think that your unit is a piece of junk, Ream will either give you all your money back, bring you a brand new one and install it, or they will... I, they won't go out and buy a competitor's product in order to play, um, but they, like I said, they'll give you your money back or they'll they'll put a new one on there, and they'll keep doing that to make it right until it's right. Um, I, you know, I have uh, personally, I've never owned one myself. I have, I have really wanted to buy one my my problem is is that um my problem with rc four-wheel drive is that rc four-wheel drive is like the porsche of the rc industry they made something that works and it's really scale it's really nice but they never change it they just this is our car just to that's what you get. We're not changing it. Every once in a while, they'll throw something slightly different, but essentially they have a leaf spring and a non-leaf spring version of the trail finder. And that's what they sell. Basically, everything is exactly the same as it has been for 10 years or whatever. Um, to me, you have to keep moving forward. You, you, there has to be some, uh, there, there has to be some innovation. I am absolutely not bashing the 911. I believe that what Porsche has done with the 911 is they they designed something that didn't work all that great in the beginning, but they have refined it over time in order to make it what it is now, which is absolutely brilliant. I have driven a 911 GT3 um, on a track, and that car is absolutely the most fun car i've ever driven in my entire life and it is and it is an absolute animal um my comparison to porsche is that porsche took something and they stuck with it but they refined it whereas rc four-wheel drive they took something 
they made a decent product, but they haven't refined it. They haven't done anything. They haven't changed anything to really make it better per se. Um, <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> and Norcal pu pu pulled it back. Uh, the, the, one of the most tragic things, um, I think that's happened in the smartphone market um, was the taking out of the three and a half millimeter uh, headphone jack. And that is done purposely so that you have to buy um, earbuds. And I blame Apple for that. Apple's the one that started it. And uh, from what I understand, Shade Tree, the RC four wheel drive uh, diffs. Um, and axles are absolutely atrocious. You have to go to, I believe it's a &M or Team Garage Hack and basically replace all of the gears that come in them, and it makes them okay. Uh, but my problem is is that um, the the axle housings that that RC4 they look really scale and they look really nice, but strength wise they're absolute garbage. They can't take anything. Um, and to me, what I've said before about scale, you're going to sacrifice something when you're going super, super scale and you're going to build a super scale rig. You're going to sacrifice some of that performance and toughness in order to get that scaleness in it. But the options that we have as consumers for going super scale is you can get you know, you can get an element, an axial, uh, Traxxas, um, RTR that you can literally drive the thing off your freaking roof and it'll survive. You know, 10, 15 foot drop, it'll survive. Uh, it's not that scale. Performance wise, it's going to be great. Toughness wise, it's going to be great. Or you can get something that's super scale that you can drive over a log that's six inches in diameter, fall off the other side and snap the axles off the thing. That's, we don't have a lot in between. That's, that's my gripe about scale. They, there, there isn't anybody out there that's providing super scale stuff that is at the level of toughness and performance of what it should be. I tried to build a, a more performance based scale rig um, using an element platform. And what I ended up building was um, a, hard, a hard body Injora uh, Defender uh, on an element based scale rig. And what I ended up with was a rig that was super, super top heavy, didn't work very good at all, uh, looked decent, not that great, because I had to sacrifice some of the looks in order to keep the performance. But Overall, just really unhappy. And then I did the same thing with, my, you know, I had the Axial Jeep. I turned it into the the Vanquish chassis conversion kit, put the bunch, put the hard body on it. And yeah, turned it into an absolute garbage fest that didn't perform with a crap and it was garbage. And now essentially what I've done is I've taken that platform and I'm putting the LC70 on it because... I think and I can get the LC70 to work a little bit better because it's not as heavy as the Injora and the RC Speed bodies, but it's still really freaking heavy. Uh, so it's not. And I put so much time and effort into building the body and painting the body and doing all the scale details that I don't want to take that scale body out and bash the crap out of it because it's going to scratch it and ruin it part of my problem with doing anything for scale scale looks means you can't have as much fun as you would if you just had a lexan body on something that you can you know roll down the rocks have fun with it uh, now one of the reasons why i love my phoenix that thing is absolute maniac out on the rocks and i can roll it and crash it and do whatever and it's scratched all the hell and i don't care absolutely don't care 
Lexan body can buy a new one, throw it on there. And it'll take me, you know, probably two hours to throw a paint job on because Vanquish is nice enough to where they trim the freaking Lexan for you. Which, shame on you, Proline. Shame on you, Proline, for not trimming your bodies. Laser cutting your bodies doesn't cost that much money extra. And it will save so many people so much time uh band-aids and freaking carpal tunnel from cutting out freaking lexan bodies so come on invest a little bit of money in making your customers happy oh sounds I mean, it leans more into the scale margin that we can be yeah uh ooh Ah, uh, it's an RC car. Happy New Year. Welcome. Uh, building a half track from a random Raspberry Pi tank and custom RC parts. We'll be doing a vid possibly a live maybe two more weeks if all good. Yeah, Lexan is annoying for cuts. Yeah, it's I can't I it Lexan irritate I'm at the I'm at the point now where Lexan irritates me. Lexan freaking bodies just irritate the crap out of me. Not because <laughs> they're Lexan, but because I have to freaking cut them. It's, it sucks. I love the fact that Axial does the capper body completely cut and trimmed, only because it's just a bunch of panels. Um, and, yeah, that's I can't think of very many that actually do pre-cut pre-cut their bodies now i mean obviously with vanquish you're you're paying for you're paying a premium because it comes with the vanquish name uh but you also know that you know vanquish does um i'm sure they have a little bit of manufacturing that goes on in china but for the most part they have most of their products done here in the u.s and of course we have to pay for it um that that aside, um, <laughs> Lexan allergy. I personally I like painting Lexan bodies. Um, I had a miserable time painting that LC seventy. Um, hard bodies are in general a pain in the neck. the The Defender body was the same way. Painting a defender body was a freaking nightmare. And I I hated every step of that. That was the first hard body that I ever painted. The original red Jeep that I built, it came molded in red. I didn't have to do anything to it. It was great. Um, I bought the white defender on purpose. And yeah, what a... <sighs> What a, what a pain in the neck. And it was even more disheartening the fact that the first time I took that Defender out, I, I said this story before, I literally had it out for 15 minutes before it rolled over and got its first scratch. And there was probably 15 hours of painting spent in that freaking body. And I scratched it in 15 minutes. And then I was so mad. The scratches are still on it. I won't even cover the scratches up. Kind of like mater from cars earned my dents each one of those dents and scratches represents memory uh, and those those scratches on that body are a harsh reminder of this is all the time that you spent painting this body only to ruin it 15 minutes in uh but yeah the lc70 same thing bought it white painted did all of this went for this really cool matte metallic red and it was it, it's it's trickier than it sounds because nobody actually sells a matte metallic red paint so i had to do it <laughs> myself and it sucked so if you ever word of caution if you ever want to do a, a matte metallic paint finish uh don't bother Best thing you can do is just get a metallic paint, paint it, then use that Tamiya matte paint over the top of it. It'll look exactly the same because that's actually how I did the hood of the LC70 because I had to strip all of the paint off of it and redo it. And I didn't have enough to put the matte back on it. 
So I decided to just buy a can of the Tamiya mat, painted it, metallic red, put the mat on there. It looks exactly the same as the rest of the body. It's slightly different because it's the hood, you can tell because it's right next to it, but it's not enough that it bothers me. When it's out in the sun, I can't tell. Most challenging kit that I built so far, uh, Bar, bar none, the Phoenix. Uh, the transmit that BFD twin transmission thing in the Phoenix was an absolute pain in the ass. The instructions, it, overall, the instructions are really well done and they explain a lot. But there's two places in that transmission where you can swap two parts that look almost exactly the same, but they're just different enough that after you put the whole thing together, get it in your truck, and put it, the transmission is connected to the skid plate and everything, so if you have to take the transmission out, you have to undo a whole bunch of shit in order to get the transmission out. So once you get everything put in, and you go to that, and you go to make that first initial, you got to take it all back out and take it all back apart. Uh, that that was that was the most difficult. I, I would say um, the overall that's the most difficult kit I built. That Toyota LC70 body build is the most difficult thing I've ever had to build in RC. That that body is just simply ridiculous at how. How many little parts there are, how many little things there are that have to go together exactly perfect in order for it to all work exactly perfect. And caveat to that is I have the opening doors with the roll-up window, and that adds a degree of difficulty because if you're like me and you don't get everything lined up exactly perfect, the freaking doors don't stay shut, and the little latch thing with the spring on it that's supposed to hold the door shut on the truck doesn't work. So that is something, that's part of the reason why the LC70 has never been finished, is every time I sit down to work on it to try and fix the doors, I get so pissed off <laughs> about it that, that I just put everything back in the box, put it back on the shelf. Gah, I don't want to deal with it. Yeah, I, I mean, once I once I got the Phoenix all put together and I got it all finished and I took it out and ran it for the first time, absolutely awesome. They, that, that VFD twin transmission is one of the coolest things that anybody has brought to the RC market in probably the last several years. I would say since the Capra, the VFD twin is probably the best new thing that has come to the RC market. Uh, and I'm talking about just straight up new. Nobody's really done anything like it before. People have done, even Vanquish has done a transmission with a dig in it. People have got two speed transmissions, but nobody built a transmission that you can change the overdrive in the front, but you can also put basically disconnect the front, make it freewheeling, and you can put the dig in the back where you can lock it, you can have a direct drive, or you can have a freewheeling, so you can essentially drive around in your truck and front-wheel drive. And like, it's just, just cool. It's a novelty thing for me personally. I don't I didn't I don't use it very much. I, I even made the mistake of I drove around with the thing cranked up in the super high um, overdrive mode for like 30 minutes or so only to realize that I was like greatly overheated the motor and I just happened to drive the truck by me and I could smell it. Um, <laughs> it's a novelty thing. If you're a competition, that's probably um, super useful. I, I, I would actually say if you're a guy that wants to have a trail truck and, and a competition truck in one, that BFD twin transmission would be perfect. 
because you could take it out of super overdrive and just put it in regular overdrive. So you like drive it around on the trail or you could just free wheel the front wheels all together and just drive it around the trail uh, like you would normally. Uh, you could use the dig whenever you wanted, or you could just leave it hooked on all the time because they actually do have a thing where you could put it in the most ex- uh, extreme locked position so that it's always engaged. And then you don't have to hook a servo up or anything to it. It just screw th- screw down there and it keeps it in the in the drive mode. <laughs> Bashable way Tamiya is notorious for how bad their manuals are. Always have been, always will be. Um, and I think I think the trick to it is is the translation. I think if you can read Japanese, it's probably much easier to build. Um, and I think that I, I think that happens a lot of times, um, Chinese and Japanese, that they they don't. There are some words that just don't exist in English in other languages. I know my my wife being from Ukraine, she speaks both Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian and Russian. And there are words that she has in Ukrainian and Russian that there is no English word for it. So, and she'll ask me, like, what's the English word for this? I'm like, there, there isn't one. <laughs> um, I'm into shade tree. I'm, I'm, I'm never, I, I've only ever been to one crawler competition. And I was, I, uh, I don't know how to, to um, like the class one, class two, class three thing, I sort of understood what it was. And I think it's like the class three, which is like the unlimited where your bully would be uh, a part of that. Um, like I wasn't that impressed with like the class one and the class two, because it goes back to the scale thing. Eh, you put scale in it, you've taken the performance away and it just doesn't work as good as it could, especially when you see like the bullies and um, the, the one that G made makes which are just straight comp crawlers and like how ridiculous those comp crawlers are. Um, you know, that how they're basically, you know, you get 18 inches or so of straight vertical and they can maneuver those things up so that they can literally crawl straight up and then wheel themselves across. Like I saw some crazy video of a guy that was like drove his crawler up the side of a staircase. It was just a wall and he, the stairs stopped and he literally just drove his car up the side of the staircase. It was insane. So I'm really interested in, in seeing how that bully two build goes. I'm, I'm going to make a mental note here to, um, to check out your video because that is, that is something that after having a Capra and seeing how, good the capper does compared to pretty much everything else um it would be really cool to have like a bully too where i could go out and like just look at some of the most ridiculous stuff like all right i'm gonna try i wouldn't try this with my you know my element truck uh but with this thing i'm gonna freaking try it because it might just be able to pull it off Ah, you know, I, I have, uh, I, uh, I don't, I guess I could agree with that. I did do uh, some hot racing upgrades on my Typhon. And the only complaint I had about hot racing was their, their descriptions for what parts go to what specific vehicle are not always that clear. Cause I bought some extended axles for my Typhon that didn't work because they were for the 6S and not the 3S. And in order for them to work on the 3S, I had to get the hubs and the carriers and everything. And that moved it out just far enough so that the, the axles worked. It was kind of a weird thing, but, um, instruction wise yeah hot, hot racing actually it was 
the other parts that I put on my Typhoon from Hot Racing, I do recall them, their instructions being very good. I will say um, Vanquish does do a pretty good, pretty good job. Axial, it, Axial's hit and miss. Some, some rigs they do really good, uh, some not as much. Yeah, motor on axle. I mean, you're getting so much of that uh, unsprung weight uh, down on the the axles that yeah, I mean, their your your weight distribution on those the 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 comp rigs are ridiculous because you have virtually no weight. There's no sprung weight in those things. It's essentially your whatever cage that you have. Uh, the chassis and you know the the little electronic mixer, so your receiver and your uh, uh, ESC, which generally don't weigh very much. You got your servos and your motors on the axles, which motors, other than batteries, pretty much the the heaviest thing you have uh, in an RC. And with most, I know with most of those competition girls, they use like these little. They use like these little dinky ass batteries that basically don't weigh anything because you're only running the thing for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes at a, at a time. I could definitely see that um, even the most built Capra probably can't even come close to the to doing what the bully will. And that's what I was saying. Like my Capra will do way more than my element you know, full blown LCG element rig will. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the next step up in performance is, you know, going from the, the Capra up to, up to the bully. It would be interesting. I, I, I mean, if it wasn't for how expensive they are, I probably would buy one just, just so that I could have one to try. And eventually maybe I will. Cause I know there's, Still a ton of work um, that I want to do. I'm, I'm essentially, I have a, a hill here on the back of my house that's, you know, 60 feet long. It's got a good slope to it. Eventually, the plan is it's going to be covered in rocks. Um, and it's going to be a huge outdoor crawling area for me. Plus, it's, it's going to look a lot better than the just weeded mess that's there now. Um, but that's, and that would be the time when I'm going to want, uh, something that's going to be like gnarly. And I, I definitely, I, I have, I have bounced around that getting the, the G made comp rig a bunch of times. I, I, I think they're super cheap. Now, now curiosity has got me. comp crawlers what is that thing yeah the gmade r1 um not uh i think it's not quite as super comped out as the bully 2 um but it's yeah it's cheap the the gmade r1 kit is 255 bucks that's that's pretty hard to beat <clears throat> the danchi you know i <laughs> Uh, Basher Boy, I, I can tell you that it's better now than when the Capra first came out because essentially there was two batteries you could get that would fit and work right in the Capra. Unless you wanted to go um, to a like a Reedy Shorty Pack, uh, which is essentially the, the Reedy Shorty Packs were made for like the the, the race buggies. Um, and they're only, I don't think they even have a 3S. They have a 2S. Um, but they were, they're really small and compact, but they don't have a real high mall level. So you don't get a lot of runtime. But there was ProTech and Gen's Ace. They had a 4300 3S pack 
um, shorty pack that would fit. And the Protec one for me fit perfect. Um, it was, I would say that Axial probably used that pack when they were designing that battery compartment because that was the one that it just slid in. You could push the wire down uh, and connect it and close the hood perfectly. Um, the Gen's Ace was a little bit fatter. It You, you can of had to wedge it in there a bit more. Um, but yeah, it would have been nice if Axial would have thought that part through a little bit better. Because it would have been better for them to put the ESC um, and the receiver in that spot and have under the driver's compartment area uh, a, a spot where you could slide the battery in from the back. Kind of the way the, the low C's are doing now with like the rays where you flop the door down and you slide the battery pack in and it hides the battery nicely and it also has a nice space uh, to fit a decent sized battery in it. Yeah, they they could have done, I think they could have done several things with the Capra, which personally I thought for the last couple of years that at some point Axial was going to come out with like a Capra 2.0 uh, and they just never have. Now they decided to come out with the stupid 118th version and charge you $250 for the thing. Um, <laughs> uh, you know the the sad part is is ooh uh, it's an RC car is um I uh I was a golfer for a long time um I I still like to play golf I have a bit of a back problem uh and some knee problems so it it's harder for me to play golf now but Golf is such an expensive hobby, and it is one of those, it's a creeper. The initial cost is, it, it can hit you pretty hard, especially if you're going to go with a, you know, a brand name set of clubs. You could easily drop a grand on a set of clubs without even thinking about it. Um, but it's the, it, it's all the, it, it's all the add-on stuff. A, I mean, it's, golf has gotten more expensive um, just to play. Um, but I mean, you're talking balls and gloves and shoes and, um, it's all that stuff that it just balls, especially for me, piss me off. Um, I was a big pro V one guy and they kept getting, they kept getting more and more expensive to, um, to the point where it was like almost angering, like, ah. Oh, are you kidding me? It's a freaking golf ball. And it costs this, you know, like $8 a ball that I could literally shank one into the water and lose it the first time I hit it. <laughs> I never understood. I never understood the, the crazy uh, pants and shirts that, that people get all into with the, with golfers. Yeah. I, I was always, I'm still, I, I'm a very plain dresser and a very plain guy. This, this red shirt that I'm wearing right now, uh, that's as about as, uh, as crazy as I ever get red, plain t-shirt. Um, yeah. And I'm, you know, so I generally, I, when I played golf, I was, I was very, uh, I was dressed very normally. I, I wouldn't, I would not wear crazy green plaid pants and a pink shirt. <laughs> you know, I have a friend that lives in Florida that has a business getting golf balls out of ponds at golf, uh, at golf courses and then sells those balls back to the golf course to sell at discounted prices. And he makes a very good living. Now, he has to deal with alligators, which is probably why he makes such a good living um, is because 
it's hard to go into a pond in Florida and not find a freaking gator in there. No NorCal. I do not wear plaid pants. I don't wear plaid anything, as a matter of fact. I have... Uh, I'm a, I'm a very uh, solid, solid color, plain, plain and simple. Keep it. <laughs> I don't do flashy. My wife does flashy. She, my wife is, a, she is a princess. She, she dresses to the nines. Me, I am, I am plain. I will wear a collar when I have to, but most of the time, uh, keep it simple. Like, I like keeping it simple. Simple and basic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that is, uh, that, the, the pants that I'm wearing now are your basic, uh, plain, uh, black, <laughs> basic, plain, black pants, Wranglers. You know, NorCal, I, I don't even have plain, plain boxers. <laughs> even my boxers are just plain, solid colors. And see, my wife, it, it, my wife harps on me all the time because I do not, I do not even own a bathrobe. When I get up in the morning, I put clothes on and I wear my clothes. I, you know, I'll get up, I'll take a shower. I'll put my clothes on. I'll wear my clothes all day long. And then at the end of the night, I'm taking clothes off, go to bed. Um, never, never been a big bathrobe guy. My wife loves bathrobe. Swears by bathrobe. She will, you know, if she can get away with it, she'll just wear a bathrobe all day. My daughter, same way. She will literally wear her bathrobe all day long. Me, I can't, I can't do it. I don't. If I don't get up and get dressed, like put clothes on, I feel like I'm not, I haven't started my day. My day doesn't start till I get dressed. <laughs> uh, NorCal, I, golf is the, is one of the few things in life um, that you do not have to be good at to love it. Uh, I think at my peak, uh, when I was, you know, I was golf, I was able to golf like three or four times a week. Um, I still got, I think the best I ever got was probably like an 18 or a 20 handicap. Um, I got, I got to a point playing golf where I stopped keeping score. Um, because after, a, after years and you, you don't, you don't improve. Um, I just figured that I, I didn't need to keep score anymore. I know that I'm going to go out and I'm going to shoot anywhere between, you know, on a good day. I might be able to shoot a 90 on a bad day. I might shoot 120. <laughs> Include some. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it yeah, golf is just one of those things. It is just like I said, I, I don't really play much anymore. My my back just won't allow it. And I used to like walking. I was a big, you know, big fan of walking the course and uh, my knees don't allow that anymore. I do enjoy. I do love me some golf cart fun. Um, you playing grassy? You don't have to mow. It's a good time. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, Bash Boy. I am. I have been lucky enough for years and years now. Probably, probably the last six or seven years where. Um, I have not had like any kind of dress look code that I've ever had to worry about. Um, right now, I you know, literally work from home, so I have no dress code at all. The only time I have to 
reasonably look nice is if I have some kind of Zoom meeting and I actually just have a pullover thing that I use that has the Ream logo on it that I use anytime I have one of those. It's hanging over there. <laughs> um, yeah, the last place that I actually worked at, I could wear shorts and T-shirt there. My boss literally didn't care what we looked like because we never saw people. Um, but I did work at a company for eight years where I had to wear a collared shirt and a tie every day, and that sucked ass. That is pretty much the worst the worst thing I can imagine having to deal with every single day. And I have a buddy that he wears a suit every day and I just, uh, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get how you can, you have to be uncomfortable all day. Yeah. Don't like it. Oh, certified easy go mechanic. Nice. <laughs> Always buy dark underwear. Yeah. Hey, yeah. <laughs> I had a friend who was a um he he was like a it's like a golf course manager um for a golf course in Colorado and <laughs> the dark underwear. Hey man, it's good advice. Solid, solid advice. Uh, but he used to get to go, you know, being a golf course manager and it was a, uh, like a semi country club kind of thing. So whenever he would go anywhere, he got to play golf wherever he wanted. Um, and it was kind of, you know, it was, it was kind of one of those mutual things like any golf course manager that showed up at his golf course they would just turn him loose and let him play for free and he took me once uh to play at um pebble beach and this was that that was actually the last time that i ever kept score playing golf was playing with him at pebble beach which i i want to say that it was like a 120 something was what i shot playing golf there and this guy's a scratch he's a scratch golfer and the barbecue how you doing brother happy new year um which it was always tough playing golf with him because he was super super good um but yeah amazing experience um i would never ever be able to play at pebble beach because i think the greens fee for pebble beach was like three or four hundred dollars per person per round plus you have to pay for a, a golf cart plus you have to pay for a caddy to be there which that was the one and only time that i ever played golf where i had a caddy and for me personally it was absolutely useless because the guy would hand me a club and be like all right dude that's what you need to get up there and be like all right um I'm going to end up short because I suck. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is an eight iron. You can make it with an eight iron. I'm like, nah, dude, give me a six because <laughs> I need the extra club to get there. Um, but, yeah, an amazing experience. And uh, scenery there was uh, absolutely beautiful. But, yeah, like I said, after that, I never kept score again because it was just atrocious. Yeah, I can believe it. I can I can absolutely believe it. Um, you now there's a lot of uh, Coca Cola. All of the Coke syrup uh, that is um, uh, at Disneyland and Disney World, Coca Cola gives it to them for free uh, because they are the they are the drink of choice at Disneyland. little fun fact there about Disneyland and you know I I heard something the other day that made me uh, that made me laugh and I actually was telling my wife about this so um, I don't remember the last time I was at, at McDonald's I don't 
it's been a little bit. We don't eat at McDonald's all that much, um, primarily because there's other fast food choices that we prefer. Uh, me personally, I like Hardee's, Carl's Jr. better than I like McDonald's, but occasionally I still, I like the Big Mac, still one of my favorite burgers. So I still go to McDonald's every once in a while. It's just you got it. There's there's nothing the same that's as 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 McDonald's cheeseburger or Big Mac. But one thing I heard was that the reason why you don't get ketchup packets at McDonald's anymore is because McDonald's was losing roughly $3 million a year when giving out ketchup for free. And they figured out that, you know, gobs and, you know, and dump a gob of friggin' a handful of ketchup packets into your bag at the drive through They figured out that a, if you didn't ask for it, you didn't give it. Yeah. People be, you know, you're driving along, you know, you get away the Joe Pesci thing. They fuck you at the drive through You drive away. You got no freaking ketchup. You're not going to turn around and go back. I'm like, give me some freaking ketchup, you jackass. You're going to be mad, but you're going to get over it real quick. And it's, but the next time you'll remember, or if you remember, you'll say, hey, put some ketchup in there. And they'll give you like three packets. Because that one of the things that how they f- figured out how to, how to do it was they literally paid a, a a consultant to investigate money saving things and this consulting firm went to a handful of mcdonald's and went through their garbage <laughs> and they realized that digging through the garbage and looking through their garbage that there were all these unopened ketchup packets. They were simply giving too many ketchup packets to people. And if they leave it out on the counter counter for people to take, people will instinctively just grab a handful and put it into their, onto their tray or in their bag as they walk back to their table. So they said, Hey, how much do you guys spend on ketchup packets every year? Oh, I don't know. Oh, crap. Somebody looks at it. Oh, God, we spend millions of dollars on freaking ketchup packets. Well, the majority of those are getting thrown in the garbage. Now, probably 60% of the ones you hand out end up in the garbage. They literally get thrown away. Or for the people who go drive through or take their stuff home, they end up with the, the big stack of ketchup packets in your refrigerator. I know because I, I currently have a big stack of ketchup packages in my refrigerator. Um. So they were literally losing millions of dollars by giving away ketchup packets for free. And now they don't do it. Now you have to ask for ketchup because the majority of the, of the franchises won't even, they won't even put ketchup in your bag unless you say something. Oh, Gabriel, what a burger is really good. I have found one here um, that I really like, which is Freddy's. Uh, Freddy's reminds me a lot of kind of in and out, um, but it's kind of like a, it's kind of like an East coast version of in and out. They don't, they don't make it exactly the same, but it is a really good hamburger. My favorite hamburger of all time is still fat burger. And I was absolutely heartbroken because we had a fat burger in Ventura and at least once a month, my wife and I would go to Fat Burger and get a Fat Burger, and they freaking closed it, just like out of the blue. We were going there on like a Sunday afternoon, we're like oh, go to Fat Burger, get Fat Burger. Walked up there and it was dark inside. I'm like, what the hell? It's closed. Look around, no sign, no nothing. It's just dark. You know, everything still in there is just dark, and we're like, oh, maybe something just happened, and they just happened to be closed. With and yeah, like two weeks later, we're want to go to Fat Burger again. And I was like, hey, let me look. Go on to their website. Yep, they closed it. <sighs> Which I can understand why, because Ventura has a population of like 100,000 people, and they have places in Dubai and Vegas, and you know. She have electricity in his manufacturing plant and a production line, something only Henry Ford is really known for. Holy crap, Heinz. 
Uh, that is a pretty cool freaking fact right there. See, uh, Bubba Q, I'm the same way. I love useless facts. I drive uh, my wife and daughter nuts because anytime we're driving somewhere for any length of time, I will entertain them with useless facts about things that nobody cares about. I love doing that. A, because there's there's just some... There's something about uh, annoying your teenage daughter that is just thoroughly entertaining. <laughs> yeah, NorCal I uh, too talk about um, there. There's the fire, the hot, and the mild. I think it is, and I always I don't like the fire because it loses, it lost some of the taste, but the hot is still. Taco Bell hot sauce still the best. <laughs> Oh, uh, hey, James, how the heck are you? Happy New Year, my friend. How are things across the pond? I am thoroughly enjoying 2023 so far. Um, I ended 2022 being on a crazy binge Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 uh, run. Uh, good to hear, man. Good to hear. Hope you and Billy are doing good. Yeah, I ended the year on a crazy, like, Modern Warfare 2 binge. I was on vacation, um, kind of a staycation, just kind of hanging out. And then I started 2023 um, on vacation as well. Uh, but I hit uh, Red Dead Redemption 2, which is... Uh, what what an insane game that is, and really freaking um, leave it to Rockstar <laughs> to create a game that is really you can really do go down a dark path in all of their games. <laughs> um, yeah. Ooh, yeah, Bob. You know, I was gonna say something about that, and I forgot when I got started. Um, yeah, Ken Block, I, I'd never met the man. Um, I know several people who, who have, um, spent time with Ken, um, and, you know, evidently he was a very down to earth, great guy to me, uh, an absolute pioneer in, in motorsport. I mean, the guy literally invented Jim Connor. Um, yeah, it was a snowmobile accident. Evidently, he was uh, going up a slope or something, and he got off the thing, and the snowmobile rolled over on him. And, you know, the guy literally hangs the back end of cars off of cliffs, and he does some of the crazy stuff, and, yeah, riding a snowmobile. Um, which, you know, partly I've told my wife, uh, it's why I've never been uh, a big ski fan. Um, just, um, snow ski, snowboarding, all of that, never a big fan. Um, probably always because it just seemed, you know, bolting down a freaking mountain where there's trees and crap and, um, <clears throat> just, not for me, but yeah, that is, um, uh, that's really tragic, uh, really tragic to hear that, that he passed away. And, um, yeah, yeah, I, I don't, I don't have a lot to say, you know, I have, uh, over the course of my lifetime and being involved in, in racing and, uh, in a bunch of, you know, different forms, cars, motorcycles, um, you know, I've lost a lot of friends along the way and I've gotten friends that are, um, uh, not really able to function, uh, anymore because of racing. And, you know, sometimes it is, sometimes it is just, 
Yeah, it, when it's your when it's your time, it's your time. That is, that's just the reality of it. Um, but yeah, unfortunate, uh, unfortunate to hear about that, and unfortunate that, um, you know, he left behind a, a wife and kids, and uh, yeah, pretty sad. <laughs> snowboard better than I can walk. And I never got the hang of snowboarding. Uh, I, I can safely say that I am absolutely was a better skier than I was a snowboard. Nitro Freak. Good to see you, man. Happy New Year. I'm very stoked. Um, man, this live has gone for two hours. Unbelievable. Uh, but super stoked that everybody came and hung out. Jake, good to see you. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, super stoked that everybody came to hang out. Like I said, I'm working on making this a regular show where I'm going to have regular guests, co-hosts, the whole ball of wax. I'm just trying to figure out how to make it the best. Um, the problem is free streaming software is you don't have many choices. And the, the choice, the, the main choice that they do have isn't exactly what i really would like um but you know at, at some point i'm going to get it all figured out what i'm ultimately hoping is that we're gonna i'm gonna be able to to do something in the way of um buying some kind of subscription so that i can get uh, mostly the quality um you know i'm i'm a big i'm a big on uh providing good quality footage you know at best 1080p because i want people to see my ugly face clear you know it's the point of watching me ramble on for two hours if i'm all blurry um <clears throat> but i am working on that i think that that is going to be something totally cool uh for this year um and like I was saying in the very beginning of the stream, I'm really looking forward to just an unfiltered, um, let it all out there go uh, kind of show. It's, you know, there's no point in holding back. Um, you know, sometimes shit just needs to be said. And, uh, you know, sometimes we got to call, we got to call out you know, companies and, and groups and organizations for the bullshit that they're trying to pull, you know? And I think today we, we hit on one RC four wheel drive that, you know, good company provides a decent product, but could do much better. Um, me personally, I'm never short of having criticism for many of the horizon hobby companies because, uh, I think that as much as Horizon has done to help some companies and help RC as a whole, I also think that having these big umbrella companies, um, it really takes away, it, it takes away something from, from our hobby. You know, I, I can remember when there weren't as many choices, uh, you know, and it was only because they're it's difficult. It's a difficult industry to be in and to be profitable and make money and hang around. And that's the reason why Horizon Hobby exists is because it is difficult to start an RC car company, build a car, sell it, and make money and be able to do all of that. Uh, <laughs> I like that, Narcal. Shit that needs to be said. Um, yeah, I, and yeah, Earl, man, happy new year. Good to see you. I agree. We are the warranty, you know, the public and calling out people is the best warranty, uh, there is. And more often than not, I feel like a lot of, uh, live streams and live shows, um, there aren't enough people um yeah kind of saying the shit that needs to be said 
You know, everybody wants to be PC and everybody wants to, uh, you know, grow their YouTube channels so that they can get the Horizons and the Traxxases and, and the RC four wheel drives and to send me free shit so I can make videos and bring in a bunch of money and and be happy. Um, you know, that is not what I don't want this live stream to be about. I want this live stream to be about just people hanging out, shooting the shit. And if we got something bad to say about, you know, something, we can say it. And we don't have to be afraid of saying it. Now, with the caveat of um, I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to, I'm not going to, you know, I don't want to get myself sued because in the world we live in, that happens a lot. I uh, also don't want my YouTube channel to get shut down. It's taken me three years to get 1,400 freaking subscribers. And uh, I would hate to have to start a new freaking channel to get all this crap back. But, yeah, as far as the chat is concerned, I don't. you say whatever you want in the chat. I will absolutely not moderate anything unless it's unless unless i'll put a tag on that unless it's creepy <laughs> creepy or illegal um uh, it's kind of why i do the show at the time that i do because this isn't uh this is a time uh for adults you know i would do it late at night but i go to bed early and i don't i don't stay up late and uh, you know, that's tradition, but during the day, kids are at school, kids are busy. This is we can have adult talk here, and you know, me, I'm not going crazy with anything that I don't think kids don't hear nowadays, anyhow. Um, yes, absolutely, James. If a car is bad, people need to know about it, and you know. I have seen over the last couple of months um, very, very notable channels that have done reviews of products that they make excuses for the shortcomings of those products. And I don't I don't think that's right. The biggest complaint I have right now is still the freaking 18 scale Capra that why Axial is selling that thing at $250 a pop, that's still just, I don't get it. It ain't worth the money. It ain't. It's not worth that much money. Um, I'm sure it's fantastic, and I would love to, if they were selling that thing for $149 bucks like they were the rest of the 24 scale, I would snatch one up in a freaking heartbeat. I love my Capra, and to have a little mini version of that to run on my indoor course would be sick. But I'm not doing it 250 bucks, especially when Traxxas comes out with a freaking 18 scale freaking Bronco and Defender for 149 bucks, 18 scale. Why is Traxxas able to come out with a completely new 18th micro scale thing that actually you guys were already making micro scale? They they just their first four in the market and they're at the same price range as the 24 scale. Yeah, I, is it, I I didn't know. Has the tracks has gone up to 180? It might have been 180 all along, but it's still to me the bang for your bang for your buck. Um, yeah, the Traxxas makes so much more sense. A charisma for 100 bucks. I yeah, I um. Oh, 180 pounds. Okay. That makes sense. That money conversion thing. <laughs> yeah. I, it, you know, I paid 120, I, I was like 125 for my deadbolt SCX24. I think I spent another, I think I spent another probably 60 or 70 bucks in upgrade parts and then probably another 34 30 or 40 bucks because i kept buying different shocks because i wanted to try different shops but yeah and i 
I love that thing. It's perfect. I play with it all the time. Yeah, I got a free minute here, too. I hop on in my mini crawler course out there, and I have fun. You know, and I, you know, I literally, I have, I have my battery sitting right here on my desk because that, you know, if I know, normally I don't know, uh, but if I know I'm going to have some time, I'll pre-charge battery while I'm, while I'm sitting here working. Uh, Dan, I am not going to USTE this year. Um, not in my, uh, not in my travel budget this year. Um, we are still recovering from our, uh, financially from our cross country move. Um, so our, our travel budget, uh, really right now consists of, um, we're trying to stay more local, not make any, uh, like big trips. Maybe, maybe next year, but personally, um, I think I'm, I'm a bit off for a UST making the trip down there. There are other, other things in line before I get to spend money um, on RC trips. I'd say probably at it best, um, the the one event that I am considering would be Beat the Creek, uh, and that's still definitely not going to be 2023. I don't think I'm going to attend any events this year at all. Um, Yeah, I I am looking at um, at the R1 RCs. They have their sprint cars and their midgets. I am a big dirt track racing fan. Um, you know, most of my racing career was spent on um, you know dirt ovals. That is uh, probably the you know my my true uh, life's passion has been dirt track racing. Super excited. We got uh, the Chili Bowl coming up this week. Um, we had the Tulsa shootout, which was uh, quite a bit of fun. Had a ton of fun watching all of that go on. Um, looking forward to 2023 as far as dirt racing scene because I sprint cars especially, there's going to be some changes happening that I think are better for the sport. Uh, but I have been looking at the R1 um because I have a nice concrete patch up here that um, I, th I think I want to get one of their wing sprint cars, one of their asphalt modifieds and one of their um, midget RCs so that I can make myself a little oval track here. <clears throat> NASCAR Bristol dirt. Yes. The great thing is I am about, 20 minutes from Bristol Motor Speedway, which is super cool. Uh, Bristol was um, at one point in time, um, I was going every year for the speed record weekends uh, at Bristol. And for a very brief, brief moment, uh, I held a track record at Bristol. Uh, it was about, I held it for about 15 minutes. And a, another driver went out in a super modified and broke my record 15 minutes after I did, which, hey, it's cool. Bucket list, Bristol. Uh, absolutely. I would say um, Bristol is one of those places where uh, one, one of the coolest racetracks uh, there is it is the banking is super cool mr sean happy new year good to see you um yeah the the banking at bristol and just the the layout of the track and especially the stands the way they have the stands built at bristol even if you're way up in the nosebleed sections it's still such a great view um and it is especially 
I would say especially the uh, the NASCAR races that they have there. Um, I did see the Cletus McFarland race there, which was freaking hilarious. Um, but any of the NASCAR series, the truck, the 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 Xfinity or the Cup series, uh, absolutely worth going to see those races because they are it's nonstop. Um, I used to go to California. Um, Fontana race, the most boring freaking NASCAR and Indy race you could ever attend. Um, just snooze fest. Um, Bristol is the exact opposite. It is nonstop action for like three hours straight. And I, uh, ooh, ah, RC car, I would say absolutely a good, uh, a good place to have on your uh, bucket list. Hey, how about that? I got me some porn spam. <laughs> All right. Wow. <laughs> it's kind of like the the thumbs down thing. You you know you're doing something right on YouTube um, if you can uh, if you can get yourself some porn spam. So. And on that, uh, on that happy note, um, I am going to say uh, sayonara for this Wednesday live stream. Thank you all so much, man. Totally stoked uh, that we started off 2023 with a super long two-hour live stream. It's pretty, pretty crazy. I didn't know that I could go that long. Um, but, yeah. Totally cool. Like I said, we're going to keep doing this. Uh, we're going to keep doing this every Wednesday. I am going to keep shifting the times around. So, um, But so far, starting off at 12 o'clock seems to be the time when I catch just about everybody at the right time. So I think that's going to be a, a good time. I am going to try and bounce the time around a little bit just to see uh, where the audience really um, hits but I think 12 o'clock on Wednesdays is a good time. Um, I got to make sure that I'm not hitting on RCU next Tuesday's stream time. I don't think I am. I, th I think that I'm, I'm still going to be stopping ahead um, before your guys' stream takes off. Um, but yeah, again, thank you all so much. Um, really looking forward to 2023. Like I said, we're we're still recovering from our from our cross country move financially, but we've made some big steps this year, and it looks like this year we're gonna totally get ourselves back onto a a, a normal track, and um, you know, as the year progresses, you know, things are gonna get uh, a little bit better. Um, also, I'm getting my get my knees back um, a little bit better. Uh, my back is feeling better. So I am going to get back out and um, actually do some crawling. I got another spot I got to go back to because I only lightly hit it when, with the Phoenix. Um, you know, and then also, you know, the season hits and the weather. And we had a really crazy cold streak here. Um, I believe like right before Christmas, we were at like minus 22 or something outside. It was crazy. But um, yeah, thank you all. We'll see you guys next Wednesday. And uh, man, have a great week. I hope everybody had a fantastic New Year's. Um, yes. And James, I will uh, absolutely see you guys in the next 30 minutes or so over on your stream. So, yep, yeah, be sure if you hang out, head on over to RCU next Tuesday. Their stream's going to kick off here pretty quick. And I will see all of you next Wednesday. Thank you.